a todos. Sejam bem-vindos à, à sétima edição da Python Brasil, que um dia já foi Python Day, e no meio do Python Day a gente descobriu que eram dois e virou Python Days. Já foi Python Brasil, e que graças ao processo democrático virou Python Brasil. Uh, mas o mais importante é que nós estamos aqui, várias temas conhecidas. Só uma pergunta, quem é aqui a primeira vez numa Python Brasil? Eu fico feliz que o pessoal da Argentina não mentiu. Eu queria pedir uma salva de palmas para eles, que eles vieram mesmo depois da sova que eles tomaram ontem à noite naquele esporte. Eu fiz aquela pesquisa informal semana passada e a gente está com mais de 60% de pessoas que nunca vieram a Python Brasil. Então, o pessoal que é velho de Python Brasil, tipo Chiru, Luciano, JS, o Marco André, Oswaldo... O Senra não vale, né? O Senra, tava, o Senra é o pai da primeira Python Brasil. Uh, por favor, contem todos os procedimentos e os cumprimentos de mãos secretos nos coffee breaks. Algumas regra, alguns recados gerais. Primeiro, as pessoas têm vergonha de sentar nas primeiras mesas, as primeiras mesas tomadas. Tá? Algumas mesas sem tomadas, a gente não vai colocar tomadas em todas as mesas, porque ia ser um absurdo. Hã? É, exatamente, o Júlio, o Júlio Monteiro, um velho membro da comunidade, ele é conhecido pelas piadas que não são piadas. Então ele falou que algumas mesas têm tomadas, mas não estão tomadas. Obrigado, Júlio, a gente estava esperando isso. Uh, o almoço não está incluído ainda no preço do evento, quem sabe no próximo ano. Uh, então, assim, a gente tem várias opções, tem dois shoppings aqui perto, e quem quiser, obviamente, pode continuar acordando aqui nas dependências. Eu sei que isso não vai acontecer, imagina. Né? Para uma comunidade que é conhecida por, mesmo em churrascos no Fisley, continuar desenvolvendo o código, imagina. Uh, nós temos aqui um Wi-Fi, uma coisa importante, eu, eu não conheço evento de, de comunidade que trabalha com software onde o Wi-Fi funcione 100%, tira o Google Devolver perder a semana, de duas semanas atrás, que o Rodolfo esqueceu de avisar qual era a rede do, do Wi-Fi, por isso quase ninguém usou. Uh, o Wi-Fi, então, é assim, por favor, sem apt get update ou disk upgrade, Uh, vocês devem ter recebido a senha, a senha é chance 50 50, usem com um pouco de parcimônia, se alguém tiver grandes problemas, por favor, procure uma das pessoas que estão de vermelho ou procure esse rapaz com camisa do Brasil, que eu vim para tirar um barato, obviamente, para os amigos argentinos. Que é importante, eles, a, a, o ano passado nós tivemos um evento de clone, um clone sem pós de América, a gente jogou futebol contra eles e perdeu. A gente queria revanche esse ano e eles fugirão. Eles se recusam a jogar futebol contra a gente. Só isso. Deixei isso claro. E para o pessoal da teoria da conspiração, esse número no crachá de vocês, vocês vão usar ele depois para pegar o certificado. Tá? Só para a gente. É, a gente ficou na dúvida de como fazer depois para pegar o certificado. Ok. Vocês têm um crachá, as pessoas costumam guardar o crachá, algumas. Aí você tem um número, você vai digitar um número, você vai ter seu certificado, você imprime ou não. Ou será, a, a ideia é que, assim, pelo menos quatro dias depois do evento, quatro dias depois do domingo, de, a, depois do evento, ou seja, a gente não vai estar no domingo, porque tem um churrasco, um garoto, cadê o bola? Bola. Eu perdi o cara aqui no bola. Foi ver a baixa. Ah, foi ver a baixa dele. A gente vai ter um churrasco, depois a gente vai falando durante o evento. Ah, vocês vão ter acesso já ao, ao certificado com todo um controle para ver se você não está baixando ele 17 vezes ou se você não está criando um novo, tá? Uma coisa importante, assim, a gente é um evento de software, a gente quis fazer algumas coisas sociais que não são sociais, dado que social mesmo é estar aqui e ficar conversando no corredor. Mas, primeira coisa, nós temos uma aplicação chamada Guidebook, que foi gentilmente patrocinada pela, pela Google Now. Aliás, o Cristiano está aí. Cadê o Cristiano Anos? Ali. Muito obrigado pelo apoio. Uma salva de palmas, por favor. Uh, em 
Então, por favor, se você tem um telefone celular que não é um Motorola daqueles mais antigos, ou o Hector também não está aqui, um daqueles telefones que não funcionam mesmo, que pode ser ó, até um... Ó, o telefone pode funcionar com Windows. Você pode baixar essa aplicação e você tem toda a grade, tem até um, um formulário, uma pesquisa. É interessante para a gente até avaliar o evento. Por favor, baixem a aplicação e usem. Além disso, uh, nós temos uma aplicação para avaliar palestras. O Bruno está aqui? Cadê o Bruno? Bruno? Eu não estou vendo, mas o Bruno, uh, um membro da comunidade, eu brinquei com ele outro dia, ele falou que o Web to Buy era muito bom, era fantástico. Eu falei, ah, legal, faltou uma semana para o evento, então prova para mim que esse negócio é bom mesmo. Está aqui o Jason com todas as palestras, faz alguma coisa de útil com isso. Ele criou uma aplicação para você avaliar as palestras e agendar a sua participação. Por favor, se divirtam, achem bugs, encontrem ele e colaborem. Isso é uma coisa que eu espero ver acontecer com mais frequência nos nossos eventos, que é... A gente... Aqui eu acho que quase todo mundo escreve código, né? É uma vergonha a gente não sair criando aplicações loucamente quando está sentado no meio da... da da conferência. Então, você tem uma ideia, Brink? O Marcelo Carcio está aí? Cadê? Estou bem bonito, mas... O Marcelo, do... lá de Pernambuco, ele também vai fazer uma Lightning Talk. Esse ano ele teve acesso prévio a, aos dados das palestras. O ano passado ele fez um scrapping e fez um data mining das palestras, falando, olha, o que, como foi o processo de submissão e tal. Ele vai analisar também as palestras desse ano. O ideal é Brink com os dados que estão aqui, os dados estão livres. Eu, obviamente, não tem com certa antecedência, porque eu esqueci. Mas, sabe como é que é a vida de Geek? Algumas coisas a gente esquece. Mas, assim, é, eu queria que vocês testassem e brincassem um pouco com, com a aplicação. E, para as próximas uh, edições da Python Brasil, a gente fizesse mais coisas como isso e, eventualmente, alguém ficasse rico e lembrasse da gente aqui, até pagasse um churrasco, ou o um churrasco do garoto no domingo, ok? Duas vezes já. O Bola vai ter que me pagar a cerveja depois. Tem o Foursquare também. Aí alguém pergunta, ah, por que o Foursquare? Porque eu sou viciado em Foursquare, porra, é por isso. Então, criei o velho, você pode vir fazer o check-in no Foursquare, ok? E para todo o resto, hashtag Pai do Brasil, Twitter, Facebook, Slide share, tirem fotos, coloquem em Picasso no Flickr. Uma das coisas mais legais assim, de todos os eventos, que, todas as edições de Python no Brasil é. Uh, putz, eu queria uma foto do Rodrigo Senra dando uma palestra ou ajudando. Rodrigo Senra, Python Brasil. Uf, aparece um. Ok? Sempre com Python Brasil e sempre com o microfone na mão, principalmente. Aliás, o Rodrigo Senna e o Python Brasil são sinônimos. Uh, então, assim, por favor, taguei, divulguem. É importante, o evento é feito por vocês, o evento, a, 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 eu acho que vocês viram, tem uma cartinha que eu coloquei. Esse evento, o evento desse ano é em homenagem ao Dona a gente vai ter uma homenagens a ele no meio do caminho. Tem bastante gente aqui que conviveu muito, muito, muito próximo a ele. Então, esse é um evento um tanto digamos que uh, emocional, e a gente está lutando para não ser piegas, eu vou ser bem sincero. Uh, então, por favor, vamos fazer como ele fazia, e fazer, dar esse esforço, e colaborar, e compartilhar tudo que vocês fizerem, hashtag, coloquem em locais públicos, e vamos que vamos. Para evitar todos os problemas que a gente tem todo ano, esse ano a gente avisa, a foto do evento é amanhã às três e meia, Boa. depois do segundo keynote. Então é assim, se você não apareceu na foto, é que você foi ao banheiro, não tem desculpa, ok? Vai estar todo mundo aqui, vai estar no segundo keynote, a gente vai, a gente não sabe muito bem como vai fazer, para juntar melhor posição para todo mundo, mas vai ter a foto oficial do evento, ok? Essa foto é uma tradição, tradição é tradição, a gente não vem com tradição, tem desde a primeira edição, a gente tem a foto com aquele grupo de pessoas todas magrinhas, alegres, saudáveis e felizes. Eu ia colocar aquela foto, mas o Chiru veio com a esposa e eu preferi não colocar porque ela ia olhar e falou Nossa, você era tão bonito. <risos> uh, óbvio, a Karen já era casada comigo nessa época e ela falava Nossa. 
Então é assim, uh, todo ano a gente faz, vamos aproveitar, vamos fazer esse ano com... Aliás, o Neymar também é outra figura frequente em fotos do, da Parque Brasil. Né? Você olha lá, está o Neymar escondido, parecendo, parecendo fotobomb, né? Você está escondido numa foto, está parecendo em outra. Você nunca lembra, mas ele está lá. E um ponto importante. Eu fiquei sabendo, assim, de última hora, que hoje, às duas horas antes do que, do que no último da tarde, do álbum, os nossos amigos da, da Associação Pai do Brasil, mais especificamente os nossos amigos do Marco da Pai do Brasil, vão fazer uma graça aqui. Nossos amigos leia esse Marco da Pai do Brasil, leia esse JS, levanta o braço, JS. Então, por favor, todo mundo que está no volta cedo. Porque se ele fizer a graça e tipo, não tiver todo mundo aqui, vai ficar meio mico para ele. E o JS é um caratismo. Tá certo? Então, é interessante todo mundo veja presente aqui às duas horas. Tá? Mas, sem mais delongas, aproveitem o evento. Agora a gente vai começar com a palestra do Wesley Chan, que eu já fui privado de assistir duas vezes, a primeira vez no Google da Nova Day, porque toda vez que eu tentava entrar numa palestra do Wesley Chan, o Otávio falava, ah, então a sala lotou, não dá mais para entrar. E em junho, porque colocaram a minha, minha, minha única palestra no horário da palestra dele. Eu estava numa sala que cabiam 300 pessoas, ficaram duas. Na sala dele cabiam 50, tinham umas 200. Então, vai ser uma honra assistir agora a palestra do Wesley. Com vocês, Wesley e Chan, uma salva de palmas. Uh, Python Brazil. Uh, I now entendo português, <laughs> portanto, e falam inglês. Ok? <laughs> The show has not started. Uh, I'm a programmer, like you guys. I like working in plain text. Right? Vim and Emacs? Yeah? Alright, great. You guys are not awake yet. I'm make you wake up too early. So, uh, so I wrote my entire presentation in plain text. So apologies for those of you who already saw me in uh, Kudin. Uh, they already know what's going on. But uh, for those of you guys uh, that have not seen my, give me, uh, haven't seen me give you a talk yet, uh, I tell you that I like to uh, write my presentations in plain text because uh, then you can kind of use the power of Python to help you with the rest of it. So there's PowerPoint, which I don't use. So I have a little Python script that reads my plain text and I'll actually make my presentation from it. So. <laughs> because I'm a lazy programmer and I like to make code do things for me.
right, so while I'm trying to get online, hopefully it's working. <laughs> All right, somebody help me with this while I keep talking. Okay, great, thank you. <laughs> and let's see, uh, have you guys overloaded the network yet? Yes. yes. Oh, great. <laughs>
almost at the same time, and they are pretty much. Actually, 2.6 and 3.0, they were almost released exactly at the same time. There was only about a four month difference. Um, and there's migration tools, and I'll tell you more about those. So if you want to read more about these changes and why Python 3 exists, then look at uh, PEP 3000 and 3100, because that will detail all the reasonings and the changes and all that. Okay, so 3.x is not backwards compatible. Uh, is your Python code going to break? Uh, probably. Do you have to rewrite everything? Hopefully not. Hopefully porting won't be really, really difficult to do. Um, of course, the easier things are going to be pretty easy. The harder things will be harder. Okay? So this is the one thing that worries people the most. They think it's the most negative thing because it's backwards and compatible. And it's true, it will not execute the most one Python 1 and 2 code. Will you even recognize the language? Of course. It's got the same general syntax, the same flavor. But you can break your programs really easily if print is changing from a statement to a function, right? Just that alone. You know, you know, I don't know if you guys have ever pulled up the Python 3 interpreter and just started to mess around with it. But the first thing that I mess up on is the print, right? It's the first thing that I forget. So that breaks things, okay? All right, so one thing I do want to mention for the team is that the core developers really feel that backwards compatibility is very important, okay? Backwards compatibility has always been uh, one of the highest priorities, and it still is. In fact, when 2.0 came out 11 years ago, it had no problems running 1.5, 1.4 software. Um, actually, 2.0 alpha came out on the same day as 1.6. Why is that? That's another story for another time. Okay. It's a long, bad political story. All right. Um, 2.6 was developed at the same time as 3.0. Why? Well, I'll tell you why. Okay. So the problem with making it backwards compat all this time is that these flaws. Are, are, are being passed from version to version to version and is taking up space, right? If you have a bigger interpreter and it has features that are not being used, it's taking up memory that it shouldn't have to, okay? So, uh, these two famous gentlemen, uh, one is Andrew Cooper, the other is Guido. This picture was taken about 13 years ago. Um, and the reason why uh, I have them in one photograph is that they both wrote uh, essays on what they felt were the problems in Python. So um, he wrote Python warts, you know, which are things like on your skin that are kind of in the way, they annoy you, they bother you. Um, and then Guido wrote one called Python regrets, what were the things that he wished he had done differently. So those things together sort of formulated the foundation of what are some of the changes in this next generation. So why is Python changing? Well, first of all, let's talk about why isn't Python changing. Well, because it usually doesn't. It's always been backwards compatible, you know. Um, but Python 3 is still uh, recognizable. It's not like a, a, an interpreter is completely being rewritten from scratch. It's not true. You know, they've taken certain things out, they've added certain things in, but more things got taken out than added in, actually. Python is not a standard yet, so it is allowed to change. Okay? It is backwards incompatible so that the future is brighter for Python programs. Let's get rid of some of these flaws that have been sticking around in the language and get rid of them. All right? Iterate, improve, and evolve the language. Because if you don't evolve, you're going to get stale and you're going to die. All right, so Python 3 is the first release that is backwards and compatible. But there is no, you know, there's no promise that they're not going to do this again in Python 4, right? Uh, but it took 18 years for this first one to happen. All right, so, it, you know, it's, Again, there's no promise it's not going to happen again, but it's, it's one of those things where it's always been a top priority. They really didn't want to break it. I mean, they still didn't want to break it, but some of these things have to be done. Okay. So, you know, developing Python is just like writing, you know, software in a natural way, right? You need to iterate constantly. Okay. Uh, 3.0 was just a bigger jump from the 2.x series, that's all. All right, so what are the main differences? So we have a couple of statements that are changing to functions. So now you're going to have to have parentheses. Uh, another big change is strings are changing from ASCII to Unicode. So we'll talk about that. Uh, we're going to have true division. Uh, the syntax for exceptions is uh, getting better. There's more iterators everywhere. Uh, and lots of other changes to types. 
which I'll talk about. So I'm going to break down this slide into multiple uh, slides uh, coming up, uh, and then some other minor changes as well. So let's look at look, look at most of these. All right. So print is changing from a statement to a function. So that's the easiest way to get it wrong in Python 3, especially if you're in the interactive interpreter. You know, you have, you have to get used to typing parentheses. Well, why is this changing? Well, if it's a statement, you know, you have print followed by a bunch of things to print. You can't really add new features to that. But if it's a function, you can add like a new feature here, a new feature there, and just sort of make them like keyword parameters. Okay. So if your old code doesn't know what those parameters are, then it's okay, it won't break. But if you have new code that doesn't know what they are, then it can take advantage of those new features. All right. So. Um, uh, and, and the other thing is that if you are, if you don't like print or you want to alter it, you know, because you have a very special version of your application, uh, then you can actually uh, change it because now it's no longer a keyword. You know, built-in functions can be replaced. Okay. So if you want to read more about this change, look at F3105. Oh, by the way, uh, these are abbreviations. If you see PIF, that means built-in function. If it's FF, that means factory function. All right, so here's the old way of doing things. So print, uh, no parentheses, even though you, you can. If you use parentheses in Python 1 and 2, that's just expression grouping. Okay, so here you see that I left out the comma, so that's why it's concatenated. That's always been in the language. Uh, if you actually want to use the new print function in Python 2.6 and newer, like 2.6 and 2.7, uh, then you can import it. So you can use it, you can see that it's here, and now I can use it. But once you do this, you can no longer use the print statement. Okay? Just like in Python 3, so you can really kind of simulate what it's going to be like when you finally convert. So here's what it looks like in Python 3, exactly the same thing. Again, I leave out the comma. Okay, it's not that bad. But it breaks everything. All right, so um, it used to be that the US was the only country in the world no special symbols, no uh, special characters or anything like that. And so everybody has problems, all right? So I'm sure all of you guys have run into this, all right? Raise your hand if you all run into this, right? <laughs> Every day of my life, ah, okay? So painful. Um, so uh, the reason is because we're using non-ASCII characters in valid eight-bit strings. They're valid byte values, but they're not valid ASCII characters, so that's the problem. And so Unicode addresses that. Right, in a nice universal way, so that there's more countries in the world. All right. um, that's why I came to Brazil, because I didn't know Brazil existed. You know? <laughs> <laughs> and Argentina, it's all really new to me. Uh, so anyway, so the, the comparison we should use is we should not say, oh, it's a Unicode versus an ASCII thing. It really is more of a text versus data. I have a bunch of data that's represented by bytes. That has nothing to do with strings at all, right? But text is, text is meant to be human and readable, okay? So when I say data, um, that's anything that's ASCII or pure bytes or even strings or anything binary, okay? So real text strings for users are, are represented by Unicode. So the changes that are coming, STR is not gonna become the bytes type, and then Unicode is gonna become the STR type. Uh, there used to be a base class called base string, we don't use that anymore, so these two are separate, bytes and STR are separate. And then there's also a bytes array type, mutable. If you don't know what mutable means, it means you can change the value. So with strings, you know you can't change the uh, characters in your string. But with byte array, bytes array, you can. And then there's a whole bunch of peps that you can look at for that. All right, so there's only been one class type. So a long time ago, Python classes were not in a good uh, situation. So 2.2 was the first step to unify two uh, classes and types together because they used to be separate. So I think I have more on this on the next slide. Um, so the old classes are called classic classes, the next generation is called new style classes, and starting in 2.2, both styles of classes are available. So Python right now is like a hybrid language. You can use the old classes or you can use the new classes, 2.2 all the way to 2.7. There's no need to have two class types, so Python 3 is going to remove the old style. Okay? They no longer exist, and all classes are the same type. We can read more. In 252 and 253. All right, so what is normal 
in classical object-oriented programming languages is that classes were our types and instances are objects of those types, right? It makes sense to us all today, but that's not the way it was before 2.2. It used to be that classes were class objects and instances were instance objects. They are completely different types and they didn't have much of a relationship to each other except that the instance had a reference to the class from which it was instantiated from, okay? Uh, so what were the problems that came from that? Well, the most important one is that Python types could not be subclassed. You could not take a dictionary and say, you know what, I want a better dictionary. I want the one that you know, maybe orders the keys in insertion order, or maybe orders the keys in alphabetical order, or something, right? You could not subclass them, so we had to make up these fake classes, user list, user dict, so that you could subclass those, and those just fake, you know, they proxy for a real list or a real dictionary. That was terrible, right? That's not the way object-oriented uh, uh, programming should be like, okay? So that's why new classes came around. So the way you tell the difference between the two is that a classic class does not have uh, a base class after, it's just a colon. But the new step class will have objects. So this is at the top, this is the root object at the top, okay? If you inherit from object, which is like the mother of all classes, then that's a new step class. So if you have another subclass somewhere down below, you have to follow the chain all the way to the top to see which kind was original. And in Python 3, both of these will create only one class type, okay? So that's another change. All right, let's talk about exceptions now. So in Python 2 and of course 1, uh, there are different ways of raising or throwing exceptions, and there's different ways of handling exceptions. In Python 3, they've improved it and consolidated it and made it less confusing. And so if you want to read more about it, then look at TEP 3109 and 3110. So let's talk about each of these. All right, so exception handling. Um, so the way you handle one exception is you have except followed by the exception name, comma, and then some optional uh, E, which is uh, your instance, and usually contains a string that tells you why this exception happened. Uh, if you want to capture handle multiple exceptions using the same handling code, then you would put them in parentheses, okay? The problem is these parentheses are required, okay? And it's confusing because there's commas everywhere. So a lot of people try this, which is not right. you get a syntax error, okay? So they're changing the syntax. So now it uses the as keyword instead. And it makes it less confusing if there's a comma. So you know that if you see a comma and it's grouped together, that's for multiple exceptions. Otherwise, there's no comma up here, so you, you, you don't make that uh, mistake. So this is required starting in Python 3 to using the as, but it was available in 2.6 and newer as a transition tool. So yes, 2.6 and 2.7 will let you use as or the comma. But in Python 3, you have to only use the as. You might as well start changing your code now. Okay. And then you can do more than 1031. Uh, so throwing exceptions or raising exceptions. Um, I'm not sure how to tell you this, but you know how in Python it's only supposed to be one right way of doing things. So when I when I wrote uh, my book, I did some research and tried to find out how many different ways can I throw exceptions in Python. It turned out there's 12. Okay, it's crazy, right? So let's and the most popular ones that you look at will look like this. So it's very possible that your Python code looks like that when you're uh, raising exceptions, all right? So of course, in Python, there should only be one right way of doing this, all right? So we're going to cut it down from 12 down to you know, like four or something, okay? So the new syntax is uh, like this. You put it in parentheses because it's to emphasize that they're classes. So in your head, you should only be thinking, oh, I'm just going to instantiate this class. All right, so you either have no uh, reason for the error or you pass in something, okay? The reason for this change is because actually, uh, exceptions used to be a string a long time ago, but in Python 1.5, they changed to exceptions. So there's no, I mean, to classes. So there should be no reason why you shouldn't do this anyway, all right? So this is required in Python 3. And of course, you know, it's available in 1.5 and newer as a quote transition tool, but you know, it's, it's because of this change in classes, not because we about Python 3 back then. Okay? And, and just a side note, we changed the new stuff classes in 2.5. Alright, one integer type. There used to be two integer types. Regular integers used to be sized. They used to be unsigned 32-bit integers. 
And if you went over 32 bits, then you'd get an overflow error. And then we would have the long type, which is unlimited in size, except for how much virtual memory you have in your machine. And then you can tell the difference between these two because there was an L at the end. Starting at 2.2, these have been unified into one integer type. All right, you don't have overflow anymore, and it's unlimited, and you won't have the L, the trailing L syntax in Python 3. Okay, under the covers, they're still int and long if you do it in C, but in pure Python, uh, there's no difference anymore. So pep 237. All right, so the division operator is also changing. Um, the main reason is Python is used to teach new programmers a lot, and uh, it didn't give the expected results. So I'm going to talk about classic division, floor division, and then true division. Um, and there are some problems with people accepting this because programmers are used to floor division for integers. Okay. So, um, so, so let's let's go over that. So classic division is this is the default division symbol operation in Python 2. Uh, if you have integer operands, that does floor division. In other words, it chops off the fraction. If you have at least one float, then the division performs um, uh, floating point division or true division. Uh, so the result is a float even if one operand is an int because the other integer is converted into a float before it actually does the division. So you can see 1 over 2 is 0. Okay, it's truncated. Uh, and 1.0 divided by 2 is a half. Okay. And so, you know, the, really the main point, the main reason for the change is, you know, you're trying to teach programming to a 12-year-old child. You tell that 12-year-old child, one divided by two is zero. They go, no. Okay, right? They, it's very hard to convince them that it's not zero, right? So that's one of the reasons for the change, the true division. So whether you have integers or floats, it doesn't matter. It's always going to be a half. Okay, and if you really, 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 you know, love floor division, you can use two slashes, which was added in Python 2. So that will always floor your division. Okay. Um, all right. So, so that's division. So now let's talk about integers. So we all know that hexadecimal is zero x blah 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 something, right? We also know that octals are just plain zero followed by the octal number. But because of this new zero x, okay, and because of this new binary rule, zero b, blah, 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 they figure, okay, let's make it consistent, so off should be zero o, all right? So the, the, o, the, the o is required in Python 3, uh, but it's available in 2.6 as a transition tool, and then more information is in F3.1.2.7. Uh, in fact, 2.6 and 2.7 accepts all the syntaxes, all right? So that's why 2.6 and 2.7 are great transition tools because you can already start coding the Python 3 way. All right, so old octal, new octal, new binary. The opt function does the old way unless you import the new one, then you get the new way. Okay, so you can import a lot of the change built-in functions by just importing future built-ins, okay? All right, so another uh, big theme for Python 3 is that there's a lot of code right now that returns lists, right? And as you know, lists are nice, friendly array things, and they work very quickly, and they're well optimized. But the problem is, a lot of times, you're gonna have to create a list of you know, thousands and thousands of objects. Makes your code run really slowly. You don't wanna allocate that much memory. All you're gonna do is go through each element one at a time. You wasted your time at and in memory allocating the space when it's not necessary. You should use an iterator instead because those are more memory friendly where you just go give me one item, give me the next item, give me the next item. You don't have to have them all in memory at the same time. Okay, so uh, all of these uh, uh, functions and methods that return uh, lists will now return iterators instead. So what are some of those changes? So we know that dictionaries have a dot keys, dot items, and dot values methods to give you all a list of keys, a list of values, and then a list of the key value pairs. We also have iterator versions of those called iter keys, iter items, iter values. All these do is return an iterator instead of the entire list. So what's going to happen is in Python 3, all of these will replace the old ones and keep the old names. Okay, so in Python 3, there won't be iter keys, iter items anymore. So they're just going to be renamed to dot keys, dot items, and dot values. If you really, really want to list of the keys, and just call a list on your dictionary. If you really want to sort the list, you just 
all sorted on your dictionary. If there's workarounds, if you're still uncomfortable with the idea of computer figures, all right? PEP 3106. Uh, updates the built-ins. So very similar. Map filter, uh, zip, those return lists. Xrange actually already returns an iterator, so this should probably be just range by itself. Um, other, built, other changes to built-ins, um, reduce move to the fossils module, uh, raw input replaces and becomes input, and then more information is in PEP 3111. Dictionary comprehensions. So this is inspired by both list comprehensions as well as using uh, the dictionary factory function uh, by passing in a bunch of two tuples, pairs. Key value, key value, key value, key value. Now I can actually use a dictionary comprehension to do the same thing. So you use the curly brace syntax, just like with a regular dictionary. But now you can do more things with it. So you know that list comprehensions, people love those because you can do fancy things, right? Uh, so you can do this. So I can do zip of range of 5, of range of 4, minus 4 to 1, which is, you know, 0, 1, 3, 4, and then minus 4, minus 3, minus 2, minus 1, 0. But I can now do something to the V, all right? Or maybe I can do something different to the key, right? So it gives you flexibility. Because people like this comprehension so much, now we have dictionary comprehensions, all right? Set literals, that's new. If you don't have any colons inside, it knows about dictionary. It should be a set. Okay? It shows you how close sets and dictionaries are to each other. They share a lot of the same data structures and seeds. Uh, empty curly brace still is an empty dictionary. So <coughs> if you want an empty set, you still have to do set for n. For n. Set comprehensions. So you know, if we have dictionary comprehensions, we might as well have set comprehensions. So, 10 to the power of i for i in range of 5, which is 0, 1, 2, 3, 4. So you can see that my set now has the data. And again, if you're wondering about the ordering of this, just remember that dictionaries and sets are unordered because they're hash. Okay? Hash types are not ordered because they're made for fast lookup by hash function, not, you know, not ordered by index. All right, so tuples are changing as well. So you know that tuples are read-only. They're like read-only versions of lists. And lists were the ones that had all the methods, but tuples don't because they're read-only. Why bother having a method on something that's read-only? The problem is there are some read-only operations that force you to convert something into a list just to use it. Like I want to count how many times this object appears in my tuple, or where is the first index where this object can be found. Well, it would be bad to have to convert a tuple to a list, to waste that memory just to call dot count or dot index, right? Those are read-only, they don't affect the data. So there should be no reason why tuples don't have those too. So that's why count and index were added to tuples. Okay, makes sense, right? All right, so reserved words, as you know, are you know, statements, constants, or keywords, things that you cannot use for variable names. So new reserved words, as and with, were actually added in 2.6. Non-local, true and false, those are all, all now reserved words as well. Okay, and then print and exec, as you know, are changing the functions. So that's why they are no longer going to be reserved words. All right, so what is a recommended uh, way for you to transition? Uh, first, you should read the what's new in Python 3.0 document that tells you a lot of things. Uh, wait for your dependencies to port to Python 3. You know, unless you want to practice, there's nothing wrong with practice. But if all the lower level stuff that your application depends on has not been ported yet, you know, what are you going to do? You know, you, you rely on Twisted or you rely on Django or something, and those things are not available in Python 3 yet, so there's no need for you to port. So wait till your lower level dependencies have been ported in Python 3. However, you can still get started now by making sure that you have really good testing, right? Because the testing is going to really help you with the porting, all right? So make sure you have good tests, and then start using the newest Python you can get your hands on, 2.6 or 2.7. Minimum is 2.6, preferably 2.7, okay? There's a dash three command line switch that you can use uh, that will warn you against uh, incompatibilities, okay? You can run the two to three tool, which comes with Python, all right? So that tool will actually show you the diff between your Python 2 version of your code and your Python 3 version of your code. Um, in fact, you can even, if you use the dash w option, it'll actually just write a new .py file and rename your old one, okay? So that's pretty nice. Uh, 
Once you have some Python 3 code now, make sure that all your tests pass, right? Because I told you, you should have spent some time making sure you have good test coverage. How much time do you have? You have a lot of time, okay? When is Python 2 going to be completely end of life? Uh, it'll be a few years, all right? So they're really not adding new features to the language anymore, Python 2. But they're not going to kill it off until later, all right? So let's talk about 2 to 3. So what are some of the things it does when it converts your code? Well, it changes the single quote back quotes to RDR because those are being taken out. Uh, print is changing from a statement to a function. It takes out the, the long L. It replaces less than greater than with the bank equals, okay, which means not equals. Um, callable, uh, that's kind of up in the air because I think it got taken out but then it got added back. Um, but it can't predict things. Like it can't stop using modules that are becoming obsolete. It can't start using new modules from scratch, right? So it, it can't be, it's not a fortune teller. All right, right. Um, you can read more about that in the docs. There's also a 3 to 2 tool, okay? So it goes the other way around. You can actually write Python 3 source and then have it port back to Python 2 with everything else. Okay, so this started as a summer of code project in 2009. Um, it's ironic that there's actually a Python 2 version and a Python 3 version of this tool. Um, but you can read more about it in these links. So you, uh, the PDF will be uh, probably uploaded to the website at some point. So you don't have to worry about writing these down. Uh, there's also a six library. Okay. Um, so this is uh, Benjamin Peterson's thing. So this is where uh, this is uh, a compatibility library between things that are changing in Python two and three. So instead of worrying about oh I'm going to use this, I'm going to use this, I'm going to have to convert, you can actually use the library. Uh, the sixth library, and it'll just go and grab all the right things depending on whether you're using two or three. Okay, I can give you more about that here. So that's a pretty nice tool as well. Uh, so Python 2, not end of life, quite the opposite. Uh, we're actually just continuing to get uh, you know, backported features to it. So 2.6 had a lot of 3.x backported features. 2.7 had a lot of features from 3.1 and 3.2 that got backported to it. So they are being developed in parallel. Yes, it's true that uh, you know, they both were almost released at the same time, and also that, uh, you know, they're not adding new features to 2.7, and, you know, there's no 2.8 or 2.9, and that's absolutely necessary. Uh, but really, the main idea is to keep 2.9x alive for as long as it takes to migrate users. So, this is my opinion, but I call for a decade. So, Python 3.0 came out in 2008, so I think that the world will not be, you know, mostly on, on Python 3 until 2018. So, there is a little bit of time, but that's just my opinion. I know how long it takes for these things to happen. All right. Not that it's happened before, it's just that it happens to All right, so these are some of the features that you can get uh, in uh, Python 2.6 already, so new style classes, uh, of course, true division, naturally. These changes to exception handling and exception raising, uh, the integer changes, the new bytes type, it's just a synonym for STR at this point. Uh, class decorators, you can get access to some Python 3 built-in functions and built-in methods, and then you can also get access to some models and packages, so you can already start coding in the 2.7 test form. All right, so there are certain things, of course, that you can't backport necessarily. All right, so print must stay a statement, of course, unless you explicitly switch to the built-in function, in which case you can't use the statement anymore. Uh, and then built-in functions that have 3 x features, you have to import them explicitly, like I mentioned, from future built-ins. Okay, so these are some things you can't automatically bring back. So um, you can also take a look at this website, which shows you like so for each different uh, release of Linux, which what are the default versions? So you can see who has like you know three one, who has three zero, who has three two, who has two seven. So that's a pretty good website to look at. Um, so number of ports. So how many packages in the G shop or Pi PI are available in Python three? Well, you can see that the growth is actually become pretty phenomenal in just a year and a half. All right, so the number gets faster and faster. In fact, when I gave the same talk at PyCon Argentina last week, there was only 545. There's already been 10 added in a week. All right, so this number grows pretty quickly, and you can actually see all the Python 3 packages in the G shop using this link. And if you were to look at this pictorially, you can see the growth uh, is, is uh, you know, it's climbing. I think the, the, the growth curve is faster starting here. So the world is starting to move 
Um, so you should try and move with it. And if you want to see this chart, you can go to this website. So this is actually the website that my program is trying to go and download this thing because this changes so often. I don't want to stagger put this into the site, uh, into the presentation. So that's where it got choked up. So I need to have a plan B now, which is if the internet is not available, you use the one that's on a local disk. So, so that's the next version of my little script over here. All right, so what are some of the big well-known packages that already exist in Python 3? You already know the names, so I'm not going to go over them, but pretty big names like NumPy, SQL Alchemy, Mako, Virtual M. Those are really big, big names. And also same goes for Python 32, Swig, and Pip. All right, so there's a lot of well-known stuff. Uh, uh, Postgres SQL is already available. There's also a new, uh, I don't have it listed here because it wasn't ported, but there's a, there's a MySQL uh, connector which works in Python 3 because it's in pure Python. Um, I should actually put that on here anyway. Because people want to know, can I access my SQL? You know, if you rely on databases and it's not a your adapter's not available in Python 3, well then you're not going to port, right? You have to have your database adapters. If you want to track which things have been ported in Python 3, there's three apps uh, that actually track these. So pick your favorite. Uh, there's a lot of guides on how to port to Python 3, so a lot of blog posts about it. There's also uh, a blog post and a book uh, from Lennox, so you can take a look at that. Um, so this is the other thing which you can't see because it actually would go and uh, bring this video uh, in, but just go to this uh, go to this YouTube video. There was a, a panel, a Python 3 panel at PyCon Australia that happened last month. Um, so I'm not a core Python developer, you know, I'm mostly a user, but this panel has three guys who are actually on the core development team for Python. And so it's a pretty good video, it's about 40 minutes long, and it gets more under the cover details about the changes happening in Python 3. So take a look at that video. Um, as far as the future goes, we're currently in Python 3.2.2 now, so we actually have gone two different releases since 3.0. Uh, in fact, 3.3 is coming next year, so in less than a year we will have 3.3. Uh, so you can find uh, that release schedule at 3.98. And then for, uh, for 2.x, we're on 2.72 right now. So the plan is that 2.7 is the last 2.x release. As I sort of mentioned earlier, Guido does not want to go to a 2.8 or 2.9 unless it's absolutely necessary. Hopefully that is not the case. All right, so learning Python. Um, which one should I learn if I'm new? So if you have existing Python 2 code, then you should definitely start with Python 2. Otherwise, you should go with Python 3. The one tricky thing is that most of the Python 3 books are probably obsolete because they're written against 3.0, uh, which is long since uh, been gone. Um, Python 2 books are not quite obsolete yet because most of the world, again, is still using Python 2. And it's easier to find tutorials in 2 than it is in 3. But there's hybrid books coming soon. So I'm actually working on the next edition of my book, and it's not going to be a purely Python 3 book because I think this transition period is going to take so long that I'm actually going to have Python 2 and Python 3 examples kind of like next to each other or on top of each other so you can see the differences. Um, but uh, you know, if you're an existing Python developer, you should start trying to port your project, even if your uh, dependencies are, are not uh, not to port your Python 3 yet, just to get practice. So there's also a bunch of interesting talks that happened earlier at PyCon US. So these are uh, probably the big, big talks you should look at to also help you start thinking in the Python 3 way. Uh, so to wrap up, um, the language is changing. So Python 3 is the future. It is the next generation, but it's already here. All right. In fact, it's been around for almost three years. Uh, it is backwards and compatible. That's true. Uh, but in order to keep the language alive, it has to always get you know uh, changes and updates, um, just to get rid of those flaws. It's still a little rough right now, but it's gotten much better since Python 3.0. So I think it, it's usable now for you guys to try. So to help you with the transition, 2.x is going to be around for a while. Um, 2.6 and 2.7 have a lot of Python 3 features that the backboard to it. Um, and then you know, use some, some of those tools that I've talked about, the dash three switch and all those things to help you code. In the end, once everybody's been moved over, hopefully you'll be happier with Python even more. Uh, but you still may need to wait a little while before you can fully port everything. All right? So thank you very much for coming, and uh, hope you enjoyed it.
as perguntas. Uh, por favor, quem for fazer pergunta, levanta a mão para a gente levar o microfone para ser gravado. Para você aparecer depois no vídeo. Perguntas, levanta a mão. Dure uma. Dure duas. Nós ainda bem. Júlio, você me pergunta na sala, por favor. Não, não envergonhe a gente. Vamos lá, primeiro o Júlio, depois o Henrique. So it seems Guido didn't have a time machine after all, right? <laughs> so uh, I, I was wondering, uh, what's the use for this non-local keyword, this new keyword? Okay, good question. So the question is, what is non-local? Um, so non-local is where, um, so you know you have local and you have global, right? But what if you have like a nested function? Okay, if you have a nested function, you want to go up to the previous function, but not all the way to the global level. So you're like one step up. So it's mostly for nested functions. Okay? Existe, vou falar em português, que seja, por exemplo. Existe algum esforço. Existe algum esforço na comunidade para que as pessoas discutam como converter o seu código de Python 2 para Python 3, existe uma lista de e-mail principal, algumas pessoas podem tirar esse tipo de dúvida? Is there an effort on the community, uh, a list or something, where the community can discuss or, or implement uh, something to deploy or, or <coughs> distribute or do uh, development to, to Pick packages from Python 2 and move to Python 3. Yeah, like a, a, a main list with uh, where the community discuss how to do this and newcomers can actually understand better ways to work their code to from Python 2 to 3. I don't know if there's a programmatic way of doing it. I haven't been checking the list, but. Uh, there is a Python 3 developers list that you could probably take a look at the archives to see if people have been talking about that. Um, but uh, as far as I know, which is probably not a lot, um, I haven't heard of something like that yet. But I think that's a good thing. Um, one of the things, there is, um, for example, like easy install if you use set of tools. Uh, there is a Python 3 version of that. So if you actually have installed Python 3 in your system and you run easy install, the version 3 of easy install, it'll only go and grab the uh, Python 3 packages. And if it doesn't exist, it, it, you won't be able to install them. I mentioned, I think the question was about uh, is there a forum where people are usually getting together to discuss coordinating issues? Uh, uh, coordinating issues for Thank you. Um, There may be, but I'm not sure actually. I, I'm not a Python 3 user. Uh, I don't know. I'm not a Python 3 user. I know. I'm not at work. Okay, <laughs> that's great. <laughs> oh, uh, yeah, it's better. We have someone that has practice in doing that. Okay. <laughs> yes, yes. Okay, sure, no problem. Oh, yeah. <laughs> okay. Any, any, any? Yeah. Now, she, now she's translating. I'm translating for her. Here. I already. I'm trying to forget my Espanol to try and learn Portuguese. Um, and I spent three weeks in Italy this summer. So like I'm all confused now. <laughs> I heard talk. Thanks for coming. Uh, what is is it the hard part of porting? Uh, is it uh, code or strings or other functions that change? Or which is the, the thing that you you see that it is hard? It's a problem which you port. Okay. I'm pretty sure everybody will agree on this. The hardest thing about the porting is probably going to be strings versus Unicode. Uh, if you're doing any kind of networking or web programming or whatever, you're going to encounter this. 
And I think when you watch the PyCon, uh, PyCon 3 panel at PyCon Argentina, um, you'll feel I should say the same thing as well. That's probably the most difficult thing. Print statement easy, right? But but bytes and strings harder. Hi Wes, I wondered why you assert that the 3.0 book would be no use to 3.2 users. What differences actually are there between the two languages? I'm not aware of any syntax. Differences. Oh, between okay, the versions? Uh, well, uh, syntax-wise, probably not a lot. I think there may have been. I think callable was added back, either with 3.1 or 3.2. Yeah, but most of it. Like the most of it is a performance thing, because Python 3.0 had so many things that were written in pure Python that it wasn't performing well enough. For example, the I/O library. Uh, I yeah, that doesn't invalidate your books, right? Um, that's true. But if in the books they say, "Oh, this is." Pure Python, but yeah. So in general, they're sort of okay, but you know, I don't know. Uh, people ask me why I didn't I did port my book to 3.0 when it came out, and I said, "Are you crazy? I'm not going to write put anything on paper against a dot zero release of any software." <laughs> so yeah, so 3.3 is a good time frame for me to do a uh, third edition of the book. How is the uh, behavior? Python 3 in terms of performance, uh, comparing to Python to something that Python 3 does. I think it depends on the benchmarks. It's definitely much better now, um, but uh, 3.x had a, uh, had a lot of things that were changed that caused it to run a lot slower. So they actually made a lot of fixes in 3.1 to get the performance closer to 3 uh, to 2.x. Uh, but I haven't done any benchmarks on 3.2 to know. Has anybody in the audience tried to run benchmarks of 3.2 versus 2.7 by any chance? No. Just curious. Okay. Well, you guys aren't Python 3 users either? <laughs> it's time to start. Okay, but yeah, sorry, I don't know about 3.2. Olá. Primeiro, você quer saber por que você escolheu Python? E. Why did you choose Python? Uh, e por que no Google uh, se usa Python? Uh, como começou a ser alguma coisa? Uh, oh boy. Oh boy. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so, why did, okay, so let's go all the way back to the Yahoo mail base. Why did I choose Python? Well, I did it. My boss chose it. <laughs> so, so there was a small company called 411.com. So you know the uh, the um, Páginas uh, Blanco? How do you say white pages? Como se diz white pages? Páginas Blancas. You know, white, white, white. To look up people's phone numbers, right? So it's a phone list. Uh, yeah, phone list, right? So it used to it used to always you have to go you have to book, but you don't have the book for the entire country, so you have to go to the library or to some government office to look up people that live in faraway places. So 411 put everything together in one online place where so you can look people up. So he did. So the CTO of this small company, he did the whole thing in C++. You have to change the link on the front page, C++, and name, and the C++ time was this big on the screen. <laughs> he felt there had to be a better way of doing it, so he started to you know, investigate. Do I do Perl? Uh, there was no Ruby yet. Python? Ah, OK. So that's why he picked that. And so, when we did uh, Yahoo Mail, but the first version of Yahoo Mail was called Rocket Mail. Does anybody remember Rocket Mail? Yeah. Ah, uh, CD. Uh, okay. So that was that was done in one th one third C plus plus and two thirds Python. So that's how that got started. For Google, it was a little different. Uh, in fact, I gave a, a Google I/O talk four months ago. You can find it on YouTube on Python at Google, and that gives you the entire history. But the original project from Larry and Sergey that they did at Stanford, the original web crawl, was actually written in Python. So that's that. But you watch the video, it, and, and Guido comes to help me with Q and A at the end too, so you can hear him talk too. Okay, so Guido is the creator of Python. In case you didn't know, but it's a <laughs> shock if you didn't know. Maybe it's for the it's for the our translator. If it's not for succinct, I'm better to read. <laughs> Wait, what? Is that true that you uh, see 
<laughs> near my window? Yeah, yeah. He actually sits over the wall in the next office over. I can see him through the window. <laughs> <laughs> he has an office. I have a desk. <laughs> <laughs> he, has, he has a window. I have a gray wall. <laughs> So we, we are both working on the Google App Engine team at the Google office in San Francisco, not in the headquarters of Mountain View, just in case you didn't know. It's about an hour apart. Silicon Valley, and then one hour drive is uh, San Francisco. Mais perguntas? Eu queria pedir uma salva de palmas 